My name is Denis Morisset. Uh, if some of you are interested in uh, connecting with me after this presentation in the future, sooner or later, maybe you can write down my email address, my uh, ESSEC email address. I'm traveling a lot, so email still is for me the, the best way to uh, connect with my students or with uh, any kind of people. Morisset at ESSEC.fr. Um, to make a long story short, I'm an ESSEC alumnus, so I graduated from the Grande Ecole, as you can guess from my grey hair, quite a few years ago. But uh, we, we were just uh, in, in Sergi Pontoise. It was the very first year ESSEC had uh, created this campus in Sergi Pontoise. Uh, after that, I did my career, most of my career, in the luxury industry. So I've been working 25 years in the luxury fashion industry at a time maybe where the competition was not as, uh, uh, as important as it is today, so I could uh, relatively quickly reach uh, managing, managing director and CEO positions. I was in charge of a couture brand, Pierre Balmain, an old couture brand. I was a CEO for Ralph Lauren, an American uh, luxury sportswear brand in Europe, and I was also um, a president of a big shoes company with factories all over the place and we were doing licensing with luxury brands and luxury groups so I signed license with Kenzo and Givenchy at that moment for women's and, uh, and men's shoes. I was the managing director of uh, Giorgio Armani, the, the fashion brand. I learned Italian during these years and that took me until 2004. In 2004 this is when my personal road uh, crossed again ESSEC road because I decided to come back. I wanted to basically teach. It was kind of a, of a passion I had. I was a little tired maybe of the politics of uh, working in the business, you know, and I, I decided to come back to ESSEC. I had not been here for 25 plus years. Uh, I found the school changed a lot. It was much more international, much more Many more people could speak English at that moment, <laughs> and I basically decided to stay. So I've been teaching here for more than 10 years. Um, I, I've been a, a director of the MBA in Luxury Brand Management for eight years until 2011, and I've been teaching uh, luxury marketing, different facets of luxury marketing in different programs, of course, uh, in the ESSEC MBA in Luxury Brand Management, but also in the Grand Ecole, in the Master of Science in Management. You know, we have this LVMH uh, chair, which is a research track. So actually, I teach two courses uh, for the LVMH students, but it's also open to a lot of exchange students and uh, all ESSEC students, basically. Uh, I also teach in IMI. Uh, you may guess from my presentation today, I have also a lot of interest for the hotel industry, for the service industry. I will not talk to you about luxury transportation, but I will take a case from the luxury hotel industry. And as you know, we have an, an also a program here, uh, an MBA uh, in hospitality, IMI, and I kind of created the luxury practice for IMI teaching more, again, you know, luxury branding concept applied to hospitality and uh, the luxury guest experience. There is a bridge, obviously, between luxury brands, you know, developing luxury service and providing luxury experience in their stores and, and luxury hotels, providing primarily service, of course, and also experience to the guest. So, uh, oh, last but not least, uh, I'm not full-time here now because I decided to partially relocate to Asia, so I have uh, one home in Beijing, <laughs> and uh, I, I also teach in Singapore. ESSEC has a campus in Singapore. I developed some short executive programs for more professionals on, on luxury marketing uh, from Singapore. I also teach in uh, Chinese top universities, but my heart still is here, uh, and I'm, I'm teaching here twice a year for, for six weeks. I'm almost at the end of my uh, my, my six weeks, so I will soon go back to Asia, uh, which is also why I, from time to time, open up a lot to uh, luxury in Asia, which is, anyway, a very big component of it. But today, uh, I have decided to share with you a, a lecture. It's a little bit like going back to school. Uh, a, a lecture on some uh, foundations of luxury brand management. Uh, so it's like a teaser on what we teach here both in the Grande Ecole, because I teach something similar for the uh, Grande Ecole, and also in the MBA Lux. But I will focus in the second part of this presentation on one case 
uh, is the collaboration, collaboration and partnership marketing. And I will uh, show you how some brand management tools uh, that I will give you uh, can be used to properly assess the relevance of collaboration and partnership marketing between brands. So that's a big agenda. Before I start, I'm curious to know, are some of you working in the luxury industry? One, two, three, four, five. Can you briefly tell us where you're working? Prada, excellent. Sorry? Christian de Couture, okay. Who else? LVMH? Oh, very good, very good brand. Who else is working in this industry? Esther Dupont. Esther Dupont. She was my student in the MBLX a couple of years ago. <laughs> Hermes, yeah, I remember. Very good. So you will see. I mean, it will be a journey. Um, I, I brought a lot of pictures as well, some small movies. Um, you know, luxury is also about aesthetics. So I hope all the technology will uh, work so that we can enjoy also this journey. So the agenda is going to be, after a short introduction, uh, again, revisiting some basics of luxury brand management and then applying these tools to decode uh, luxury uh, collaborations, collaboration between brands, partnership marketing. And I will try to explicit, because it's a kind of a, of a white box. Uh, you know, there is not so much literature on these collaborations. And, of course, case studies to make it very concrete and practical. So, whenever I start, you know, a, a, a conference on, on the luxury industry, I always start reminding the audience that uh, luxury is a tricky word. Uh, if you go back to the etymology, uh, whether it's in Latin or in Chinese, you know, it kind of brings the best and the worst at the same time. So I think it's inherent to the, the concept of luxury. You know, it's the paradox of luxury. It can be associated with the best because you truly have beautiful products and pa people passionate behind this industry. However, as it deals, of course, with very expensive product, it deals with money. You don't always choose your clients, and it's true also that luxury can be linked with corruption. And luxury can be a little bit out of context when there is a financial crisis and people realize that, you know, there are much more important issues in this world than uh, luxury products or luxury service. So I think this will never change. And, and you know, you, you remember maybe in 2009, during the, uh, after the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy, it was this kind of luxury shame. This comes back from time to time, you know, for uh, CEOs of American listed companies traveling first class or staying in a luxury hotel was absolutely not relevant. So the language changed, maybe the selection of hotels as well. Business, yes, luxury, no. And uh, that's the way it goes. At the moment, you probably all heard about the fact that some uh, government uh, officials, in, in the, the president of China, President Xi, and the president of Korea, both took a, a certain stand against corruption, and uh, they, of course, pointed at the luxury industry as often being linked with corruption. And there was, uh, you know, obviously, a certain um, effect, impact on the luxury industry. I mean, these things are normal. You, you will never change the world, and uh, I think. You know, my definition of luxury, what attracted me when I started to work in this sector was the passion for beautiful products. You know, you really have people here uh, from the craftsmen to the product managers to the people who are selling these products, you know, who really have a passion for the beauty, the aesthetic. It's beyond quality, you know, the excellence, trying to reach excellence. This being said, as I said, you don't always choose your clients. And unfortunately, and it will always be this, the case, you know, you have certain clients and sometimes some of the most, the richest clients who may not buy luxury goods only because they appreciate, you know, the superior quality, the aesthetic of this product. So this will always be the case. Also, it's a big business today. I mean, it was not the case before. It has become a big business, as you probably know, when this industry started to structure itself. LVMH, Richemont, Caring, you know, participated in that evolution, which took place basically in the last 30 years, and have seen the transformation of family houses 
in brands, groups of brands. And this is where you know, the, uh, the luxury marketing, luxury brand management really started. And ESSEC was at the beginning of this uh, adventure as LVMH created with uh, ESSEC this uh, research chair on luxury brand management back in 1991, when even LVMH was a very young group created in 1987. So um, let's now revisit some foundations of, of luxury brand management. I, I will, of course, remain quite global in my presentation, but you know, what differentiates? It's still a good question. You know, managing a luxury brand from managing FMCG brand. Because let's, let's be totally honest, you know, brands existed before luxury brands. Yes, Dior, Chanel, Louis Vuitton have a long history, but they were not maybe really brands at the beginning. They were more workshops, you know, family houses, while Coca-Cola and P&G has been, you know, has learned how to manage a portfolio of brands many, many years before LVMH was created. So it's kind of interesting that today people refer often to luxury brands as being, you know, the best in class, but brands existed before and brand management existed before luxury brand management. So, you know, to answer this question, the problem is that, you know, words have all been used too much. And uh, I am in China where everything which is sold at a premium price is called luxury, where any kind of premium brand pretends they are unique. So I'm a little, I'm a little, you know, <laughs> hesitant to use the word uniqueness because it may have been a word that has been heard too much. But in the end, I think this, this word, if it is used properly, still enables you to differentiate real luxury, absolute luxury, from the rest. It's when a brand can claim that they are truly unique. I will talk about champagne a little. We have French people here, they, they like, they appreciate champagne. No Krug, no thanks. This could see as an arrogant kind of slogan, but it came at a point where Krug, you know, was a little bit over, overshadowed by Dom Perignon and some strong marketing. And they realized, you know, that their champagne was really unique and there was nothing they should be ashamed of. So no Krug, no thanks means, in fact, if I really like Krug, the taste of Krug, for certain occasions, maybe I don't want champagne, I would like Krug, so no Krug, no thanks. When you can say that about a product, you know, obviously it says something. The product is kind of unique, or the emotions associated with the brand are kind of unique. And you know, uh, each sector is different. If you think about the car industry, obviously, you know, the luxury, the real luxury sector is a tiny, tiny bit of it. Most of the car industry is dominated by premium luxury brands. Reason why I show you these pictures, because these are, of course, you know, uh, pictures that show the signature of real, absolute luxury brands in terms of price, in terms of rarity. And here, as you can see, they are also unique by, the, by their design. And, and most of the time, what means unique? It means if you really like, you know, this kind of sports or ultra, a luxury car for, for comfort, like Bentley or Rolls-Royce, you know what you like, you know, you know what you like. You are not going to compare if you have one million dollars to spend and you can afford this kind of car, either you will go for the speed and you will go for Ferrari or Maserati or Lamborghini or even Bugatti if you can really afford, but you know what you want, you know, they are more unique also in terms of design, in terms of people don't compare. While, you know, this is really what the business is, you know, this is the business. These are the people who control the business. And obviously, within Lexus, BMW, Benz, or, or, or Audi, you have luxury models. Luxury models which maybe compete even with, uh, you know, with, with Bentley for, for some of them. But the brand itself is more comparable. And you see, I, on purpose, I show you pictures with a little bit of distance. You may not even recognize them. And the, 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 the core of their business, you know, is still at a price point where if you have 50,000 euro to spend now on a car, I guess most of the time you are going to compare. You're going to see for that price, 
you know, what value you can get. So it's more value for money driven. And here you are going to compare probably Benz, BMW or Audi. So you see the differences here in terms of uniqueness. The point is behind uniqueness, and I don't want to stay on, on that topic, is how can luxury brand enhance their uniqueness? And uh, on purpose, I say uniqueness. You can ch change un luxury brands by premium brands, and then the, this concept still works, except it may not be uniqueness, it may be difference. Differentiation, uniqueness. Uniqueness is a higher degree of differentiation. You know, premium brands are different. They are alternative. They try to show their difference. Luxury brands are even more different. They are different to the point that they could be perceived as unique and less comparable. But what is DNA in codes is basically, it's like a toolbox. And I will share with you the, the meaning and how to use these tools. It's basically a way for luxury brands or maybe even premium brands to enhance their uniqueness, or at least their differentiation, their alternativeness. Uh, and of course, the difference is that luxury brands are even more consistent. They, are, they pay even more attention to all the small details when they manage their identity through these DNA encodes um, toolbox. So let me share with you a little bit. You may have some idea about what is DNA, because Actually, you know, we are all different. We can almost say we are all unique in this, in this room, right? Because we all have a different genetic code. And as you know, we can be identified by the police through this DNA nowadays, you know? So that is at the level of the individual, the, the real meaning of DNA. So why using DNA for brands? It's the analogy, you know? The, 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 just the word DNA is interesting because it enhances the fact that Luxury brands prefer to talk about DNA than brand identity because they want to enhance their uniqueness. The fact that they are absolutely different, cannot be compared, cannot be so much positioned like in traditional marketing. Often, the DNA, where does it come from? You can make the same parallel with individuals, you know? Our genetic codes, to a large extent, come from our parents and our grandparents, you know, while for brands, also, often it comes from the founders. It comes from the people who created their, this brand. What was their perspective? What did they want to bring to the market? What were their values? Uh, what was the time when the brand was born? What was the environment of the brand? What was the geography? All the factors that influence you know, the perspective of the founder on, on, on the particular product. It could be the know-how, the special know-how. So often, you know, to understand the DNA of a brand, because this is the idea. Luxury brands work on understanding their DNA. It's like, you know, everyone should understand who he is. If you know who you are, you are much more efficient. You are much more likely to be successful in life. Same thing for brand. So DNA can be also, I mean, what is important, DNA is not what the consumers want. That's the privilege of luxury brands. You know, they have this vision, they have this signature they are not defined by consumers. Doesn't mean they don't have to listen to consumers for a lot of reasons, but their DNA, you don't tell me who I am, you know? You don't tell me who I am, I know who I am. DNA, it's also, you know, a marketing tool. It's also a communication tool. The DNA should be differentiating. Among all the brands that produce the most beautiful leather handbags, you know, what is the difference? What is the different perspective? It's not just about leather, because potentially they have very similar leather and similar craftsmanship. So DNA should be differentiating. Um, it should really try to enhance the brand uniqueness. And uh, of course, different brands may share one or two genes, I mean, um, Louis Vuitton is obviously about travel journeys. Hermes also likes travel, but maybe in a different way. And then the combination of the different genes will make, of course, the final DNA of Hermes different from the DNA of Louis Vuitton. So this is a very powerful tool, but this is just the, the beginning. The, the beauty of it is to now associate the codes with the DNA. Alors, some people, some brands, 
talk about the same thing with different words. So what is important is the meaning, not the words. You can replace DNA by personality, by values, if you prefer. In the end, it's not going to be totally different. But codes, it's different. You really need to understand the difference between codes and DNA. Codes, it's really anything which is visual. Visual, not only visual, it can be about the five senses. It can be something you smell. It can be something which uh, you know, appeals to, the, to, the, to your ears. It could be a sound, it could be a music. It's anything which can be seen, appreciated, can appeal to the senses, and of course, which is linked with the DNA. The codes, it's much easier in a way to identify because all codes have visual clues, more or less subtle, more or less you know, visual, but they all have some codes, starting with the color of the packaging, for instance. But it can be iconic products, it can be the brand name, the brand logo, but it can be much more than that. So the codes, obviously, in the end, is what helps you identify the brand visually through its product, through the store design, through the digital marketing, through the website first page. But what the beauty of it is when you have few codes, strong codes, differentiating enough, and codes that are connected with the DNA. This is the ultimate beauty of the, of the system, is to find codes that help clients understand the DNA of the brand. It may be very easy sometimes. Usually, I talk about Hermes. Today, I decided to change. But Hermes, you know, usually is a brand I use because most people have some idea about Hermes. So I will not talk about it, but I will just maybe use it two seconds. Most people who know Hermes know that the equestrian culture is important at Hermes. So the DNA obviously has something to do with horses because Hermes was born to serve horse riders, right? They started creating harness, then saddles, then back to carry the saddle and the boots and the harness, and then, then they move on. So, you know, when you have been producing products for horses for 100 years and you like horses and you like horse riding, it's in your DNA, clearly. And not many brands have horse riding culture so much in their DNA. Now, think about the codes of Hermès. The calèche, the logo itself, you know, in the stores, the hand, the feet, if you ride a horse, you know that the most important is the feet. You hold the harness and the, the feet, you know, and the, the hands and the feet, you control the horse. You know, the boots, the horse, the saddle, all these codes obviously convey easily the DNA of Hermès. But today I would like to take another case. I would like to take a, a brand which has similarities with Hermès in a way. Uh, it's also French, it's also a, a, a beautiful signature. Uh, it's Van Cleef and Arpels. How many of you think they could identify codes or DNA of Van Cleef and Arpel in the room? Can you raise your hand? Has anyone some clue? Of course, you, you and you. Uh, you I know because you are my student. What about you? DNA or code? About the code, I would say visually you can identify your product for Von Cleef for the Alhambra sign, for instance. The Alhambra is a code. It's a product uh, category with the Thomas code. Another one? Uh, another one would be the Little Fairy, for instance. Very good. Alors you have identified two codes. What about the DNA now? Uh, this is more difficult. The DNA is always more difficult, you know, because sometimes, uh, of course, all jewelry brands, it's about love, it's about, you know, beautiful products, it's often feminine, but there are many ways still to be different. Cartier and Van Cleef and Arpel are very different. So what could be the DNA of Van Cleef and Arpel? That's more difficult. Anyone? Anime guy, this one you can... Basically, we could start with art because it always has an instinct with art, um, especially with fantasy world as well, which is very fairy tale, very, uh, too many butterflies, a dream, a dreamland. Yeah, yeah, the magic. Very good. And you know, this obviously differentiates already a lot Van Cleef and Arpel. 
At Van Cleef and Arpol, the creativity is very much linked with art. And you know what is interesting, it's a, it's a small story, is the CEO of Van Cleef and Arpol used to study in ESSEC. And when he graduated, he was passionate by art. He wanted to work in art, combine art and business. So finally, he found a job at the Cartier Foundation managing the, administratively the Cartier Foundation, but that made him still work in the, in the environment of art, Cartier Arts Foundation. And then later, later on, when Cartier Richemont acquired Van Cleef and Harpel, he was promoted creative director because he was the right person. You know, he spends his life in museums, also uh, reading old books, legends, poetry. And he was the right person because Van Cleef and Arpel was always inspired by art, by poetry, by, by fairy tales. Alors, let's do the exercise as if we were really working as a consultant for Van Cleef and Arpel and helping them understand their DNA. First thing we should do, we should go back to the beginning. You know? So at the beginning of this brand, you have a couple. So you have a love story, a beautiful love story between Estelle Arpels, a family of uh, stone uh, sellers, and Alfred Van Cleef, the son of a stone cutter. So two Jewish families wanted their children, and their children loved each other. It was a love wedding, not a wedding arranged by the parents. And they were really so much in love that they decided to create a company together. And Van Cleef and Arpel opened Place Vendôme in Paris in 1906. So, you know, Paris plus Vendôme, a love story between these two young people, that's already important to understand the DNA of the brand. That the, the concept of love, you have different love expression in all jewelry brands. They all talk about love, but at Van Cleef and Arpel, maybe it's a love story which is at the beginning the love story of the founders, which is interesting. Then, you know, I think, uh, and it's not exhaustive, I just take you through this exercise, you know. Paris, of course, because the brand was born in Paris. New York, to a certain extent, because the brand is extremely well-known, appreciated in New York, because they moved to New York very early on, and it's the only brand to have the privilege to be in the same building as um, this beautiful department store, Bird of Good Man, without being part of Bird of Good Man. And, you know, one day, I brought my students to New York, and we, and we visited. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel made an exhibition in the Hewitt Museum. And you could see the clientele who came to enjoy. You, you could see the richest, the richest people in New York. So this brand has also some very strong cultural connection with New York. Love story. Craftsmanship, yes. But craftsmanship would be generic. Here, I added innovative because the craftsmanship of Van Cleef and Arpel is extremely innovative, and I will show you why and how. Then, art and creativity, because creativity is linked with art, but also with poetry, with romance, with legends, with fairy tales. You cannot believe to which extent, you know, this is the key to enter the door of Van Cleef and Arpel. You can talk about nature also. A lot of luxury brands like nature, so nature is important in the world of Anglef and Arpel. And uh, mysterious. There is always a little idea of something mysterious. So this is already quite differentiating. I think, you know, not another jewelry brand could be mixed, you know, confused with Anglef and Arpel. Cartier would be very different. Cartier, you know, I have not thought about it recently, but... Uh, I think the words that Cartier would like to hear, and they would like to be defined by these words, would be more power. You know, it's a powerful brand. It's a number one jeweler. It's a jewelry of the king. It's a king of jewelers, and so on and so forth. So, you know, love, but it's a different kind of love. It's a love that is almost an obligation for the richest, strongest brand to give back to, to the society. So, love collection, charity, it's a very different idea of love, even if Cartier also produced a lot of jewels for love stories. So, you know, this is to show you that DNA can help you enhance the uniqueness of the brand. Then the codes, my God. 
I, I, I stopped at the end of the page because, you know, here, of course, opening up to products and, and collections, I found a lot of codes. Um, some of these codes are particularly interesting because obviously they relate to the DNA. And this is what I wanted to show you. Um, Place Vendôme is a code. Paris is more in the DNA of the brand, but the brand was born in a Paris environment, Place Vendôme. So the colon Vendôme, of course, is a code. It's part of the logo. Um, the ferry, you know, the ferry is the practical identification of the fairy tale. You know, the fairy tale is, comes alive through that fairy, and that fairy has been declined in many, many different ways. The butterfly among, you know, representing nature, the charms, Alhambra, uh, different flowers, uh, and also a number of complicated concepts which have something to do also with the innovative craftsmanship of Van Cleef and Arpel. So, See, for instance, you know, why did I mention uh, in the codes this uh, zip, zip necklace and transformability? Because this was something that in the archives of the brand, we found out that, you know, this brand always wanted to create jewelry which could be transformed. So you can transform actually this zip necklace in a ring. Um, they also master a technique called mysterious setting. Mysterious, again, setting. Mysterious setting, it's a way to, you know, to, um, you don't, you, the, the, the stones hold together in such a way that you don't see how they hold together. It seems to be magical. It's so mysterious how so many small diamonds or some stones can hold together. Prong setting is another technique. Invisible articulation is another technique, which are mastered by the, you know, the, uh, the workshops of, uh, and all these codes, because it can be viewed as codes, uh, obviously enhance the fact that, yes, it's about craftsmanship, like all high jewelry brands, but it's a very innovative craftsmanship, because finding a way to articulate invisibly, you know, the jewels together, this amazing. Also, you know, codes can be linked with product collection. In that case, there are almost no more codes, but they participate in the storytelling of the brand. Here, it's very simple. When it is so simple, it is great. The best things are simple, easy to understand. You see, these are all the high jewelry collections of Van Cleef and Arpel. Uh, I think the last one was Podan. And, you, you know, between Podan, Les Voyages Extraordinaires, which refers to Jules Verne, uh, between uh, Le Palais de la Chance, which, between L'Atlantide, between Midsummer Night Dream, which refers to Shakespeare, you can totally understand how much, you know, these codes, which are here names of the collections of high jewelry, convey an element of the DNA which is completely unique to Van Cleef and Arpel, which is fairy tale and legends. All their high jewelry collections are named and created after legends. Amazing. Amazing. Now, I will uh, show you another aspect of uh, how powerful is the management of DNA in codes. Van Cleef and Arpel is a jeweler, a high jeweler, but of course, you know, luxury is a business. I will come back to it later. So they also need to make extensions. They could not probably survive today only with high jewelry. So watches is a natural extension for jewelry brands, as you know. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel, uh, unlike Cartier, did not have such a heritage in, in watches. In fact, you know, they uh, created a Cadena watch, which was linked with uh, first a cadena patent registration, which was linked with a piece of jewelry also, the cadena, a code. Then they created a cadena watch, a little bit symbolic. And then Pierre Arpels created the first real watch, the Pierre Arpels watch in 1949. So you see that the brand didn't have a real strong legitimacy in watches. 
They had a couple of jewelry watches, but that's it. So here, interesting question is how the DNA can help you find out what is good for your brand if you want to make a brand extension. And this is a very nice case. Uh, you know, Van Cleef and Arpol, of course, being part of Richemont, had all sorts of reason to develop in watchmaking. They had the knowledge of Richemont. It was obviously, I mean, jewelry watches are growing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there were some obstacles. Uh, watches are primarily men's products, right? And even if now you have a couple of uh, uh, men's watch brands which try to develop women's watches, at the beginning, you know, often women like to buy men's watches. Me watches is men's jewelry, we often say in the industry. So that's the first problem. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpel is not about men. I mean, even if they have the Louis Arpel watch, you know, it's, it's a brand which is feminine, completely feminine. So going into men's watches would not make sense for them. Second issue, why do people buy expensive watches? Because of the complications, you know, because of the complicated movements which characterize, you know, this know-how that has been maintained in Switzerland despite the quartz revolution. But again, movements, mechanical complications, this has nothing to do with the DNA of Van Cleef and Arpo. So they did something just incredible, which maybe you have heard of. They invented a new way to talk about watches. They talk about extraordinary dials and poetic complications. Extraordinary dials, so you know, the dial, which is something very mechanical, with Van Cleef and Arpel becomes extraordinary, magical. And the complications become poetic. <laughs> How come? How come? It's just words. No, it's not only words. It's actually something which has completely been uh, supporting the development of Van Cleef and Arpel in watchmaking. And this is about their vision of watchmaking, which is the poetry of time. So, basically, you know, obviously these watches that I will show you are complicated. They are assembled, produced in Switzerland. They are Swiss made. The dials, the, the movements have different kinds of complication. But this is not the, the most important point. This is not what they want to put forward. What they want to put forward is the poetry of time. So basically, they have created lines of, of watches where all the jewelry, poetic world of Van Cleef and Arpel is present. And here, the complications, of course, you know, have to do with how the wings of the butterfly can represent the, the minutes and the hour, or how can, um, you know, the, um, uh, you know what I mean? Alors, the, the, the most beautiful part in this collection is the poetic complication, because here the focus is completely on the story, on the emotion, and not on the real complication. But there is a complication, of course. And here you have watches that have been developed uh, from, again, the fairy tales, and some of the uh, high jewelry uh, poetic uh, inspiration. And a day in Paris, day and night, Lady Apple's Ferry, that cannot more convey the true DNA of the brand. One of the most famous watch in that category is Le Pont des Amoureux. You know, it doesn't even need to be translated. That's the privilege of a French brand. Uh, if it had to be, it would be Love's Bridge, but it's Le Pont des Amoureux. And here, obviously, there is a real complication because you probably understand that the, the women, the, the madame stands for the hours, the men for the minutes, and at midnight, they are on a long-awaited rendezvous. They will finally meet at midnight, so they will, the two characters will get close, they will symbolically kiss each other, and then the, they will come back to their original position. 
you have a lot of complications behind that. But this is not the focus. The focus is on the emotions, on the fact that this watch is talking about love, poetry, in a complete Van Cleef and Apple way. And uh, I have a small, very small video to show you. Well, I think it's, uh, it's clear. So um, I, I took this case today to illustrate in a pleasant way the concept of DNA encodes, which of course can work in many different environments. Hope you liked it, but we need to move on. It's not the end of it. So after understanding that luxury brands have this uniqueness and that mastering the art of uh, having strong DNA and consistent codes is the best way to enhance its uniqueness and be recognized. Of course, they also need to manage the paradox of time. You know, it's a long story, I will be very short today, but when you think of it, being old, why would it be an advantage? You know, very often I hear in Asia, people are impressed by the heritage of luxury brands. You know, most of the time when people are old, they become less <laughs> interesting, less relevant. So, you know, it's the same in reality. Luxury brands, yes, they have a long history. It can be seen as an advantage, but at the same time, it's a, also a big challenge. They need to stay relevant. They need a particularly, you know, again, I need to make a long story short, but uh, what has changed in the last 20 years, maybe, is more and more consumers have their own definition of luxury. You know, it's no more, we are no more all belonging to the same social class, having the same education, the same vision of luxury. 
we end up having more and more our own definitions. So how can luxury brands remain true to themselves, to their DNA, and at the same time, try to be relevant or to remain relevant to evolving consumer culture? I will show you two cases to, to show you this in a pleasant way. You know, take champagne. Champagne is traditional by essence, you know, it's traditional. It, it conveys traditional values, you know, it's an aristocratic, sparkling wine. It's a serious industry. Is it necessarily something that will be relevant for younger generation, which have been brainwashed by vodka brands and the cocktails and the fact that there is no pleasure without the music of the ice cube in the glass, you know? What, who knows? I mean, there is nothing that says that necessarily my children and my grandchildren will have the same respect and the same, you know, interest for champagne. So, Moët et Chandon did something funny. Well, it's just an example. Uh, they created recently a, a special uh, Moët et Chandon vintage, which can be, you can drink on the rocks. Of course, they play with their codes in a way, because normally champagne should be kept at a certain temperature. You should not drink it icy. But here, you know, what they are doing is marketing. They are recognizing that a lot of young people, or even not so young people, in Central Pay, a lot of people drink champagne near the, ice, the swimming pool, you know, in the hot weather. And why not playing with other codes, such as ice? So they created this uh, Moët et Chandon on the rocks, uh, they called it Moet Ice Imperial. Imperial is, of course, in the DNA of the brand. So here you see how they play with their codes. They, they don't betray, you know, it remains champagne. They don't betray their DNA, but they play with their codes to kind of send a signal to maybe a younger consumer that, hey, champagne can be cool. And uh, another case which you may have seen uh, recently is, I mean, Louis Vuitton is obviously a brand which is always, always innovative in terms of how they can play with their codes. And, and you know, the new designer, Nicolas Gasquier, for the first fashion show of Louis Vuitton, brought back the trunk, the la, mal, mal means trunk in France, you know, and, and he designed for, for the fashion show this line of the petite mal, you know, which is bringing back one of the most important codes of the brand and make it, maybe make it fashionable. Playing with the idea of a, a handbag that would be made as a little trunk with little wood. And actually I saw these small trunks, Petit Mal, being produced in Anier, where uh, Louis Vuitton has the workshop that still produces, you know, the, the trunks, because you can still buy trunks, special orders. But with the same technology, they created this uh, petit mal. Initially, they thought it would be just, you know, um, catwalk bags, limited edition. And now, a lot of clients like it, in China in particular. And, uh, you know, now, so this one in particular, you know, red is a popular color in China. This one has been ordered by a lot of, of Chinese customers, so then they are keeping it in the store, and they are going to probably keep it in the collection for a while. That small object retails at a little more than 3,500 3, euro. So it's also, you know, a quite expensive product. So it's just another example how brands can play with their codes to manage the time paradox and make the, the trunk cool and fun again. Okay, moving on. Uh, the fourth uh, foundation, of course, is or you can express it in many different ways. I, here I say balance image and business, but I could also say, you know, manage exclusivity, which is more on the image side, and accessibility, which is more on the business side. This is probably the most interesting because it's the day-to-day -day of any luxury brand CEO or, or manager. He needs to grow the business. You know, it's a business, he has shareholders. So how can you remain perceived as exclusive, luxurious, how can you enhance your image and continue to grow the business? It's a science, it's an art also. It's a mix of art and science. So you know, this is of course a very complicated uh, challenge for, for luxury brand, how to balance it. And uh, 
I go back one second to Van Cleef and Arpel because this is an illustration. Even a brand like Van Cleef and Arpel, which has such a unique, a unique know-how in the high jewelry sector, cannot only sell high jewelry. Not only they sell watches, not only they sell, you know, jewelry and even relatively affordable jewelry, relatively, with the Alhambra collection. But they even developed a line of fragrance, not so much maybe to create a big business, but also, you know, to potentially enable, maybe some of you after this uh, presentation, you will want to bring Van Cleef and Arpel into your world, but you cannot yet afford to buy the watch or the jewelry, but you can buy a bottle of fragrance and you can bring the little fairy in your bathroom and still, you know, bring this brand into your world until the moment you will be able to go one step further with the brand. So this is also part of managing image and business, managing exclusivity and accessibility. Last but not least, um, the experiential trend. This is what brings together more and more luxury product brands and luxury service brands. You know, the clients are the same. They are exactly the same. And these clients, you know, they look increasingly for experience, whether they buy traditional luxury goods or whether they buy a car or whether they travel, they stay in fancy hotels. You know, in the end, there is more and more focus on experience. And this is something luxury brands need to integrate in the way they sell their product, how to also provide, you know, a shopping experience which is going to be differentiating, how to develop a service culture which will reflect the uniqueness of the brand and why not the DNA of the brand. So that's a big chapter and I will, uh, I have another 30 minutes to now uh, show you a little bit how these tools I, I gave you uh, can help understand collaboration. Hello. Collaboration, it's a, like I said, it's a white box, you know, not so many people understand really where collaboration starts. You heard about co-branding, partnership marketing, distribution partnership, you know, it's, it's a white box. However, I will give you some, uh, a toolbox again to assess and understand a little bit what's behind this collaboration. First of all, why do we see more and more collaboration? I think because the, the world is becoming more and more complex, brands have to move more and more a little far away from their core competencies. The experiential trend, the lifestyle trend, brings them to do things they were not familiar with. And here, you know, they need to make alliances. Actually, the critical mass uh, is higher and higher for luxury brands to compete internationally. And this collaboration belongs to a much larger um, uh, kind of, of, of uh, uh, attitude, which is look for partnerships, look for collaboration. M many, many reasons expla exp can explain the need for collaboration and creating alliances. First and foremost, consumers are empowered. You know, where consumers were passive receivers, luxury brands, it was a lot easier for them to control these consumers. Now that they are empowered, that they can use social media, that they can buy online, that they can compare prices, luxury brands need to be more and more alert to deal with this. Also, globalization, the fact that critical mass is more important, the fact that you cannot master all these extensions in-house, uh, the shift toward experience for small brands, but even for big brands, requires different categories of partnership, collaboration, and alliances. And I will uh, show you that it's not only small brands who do it. But first of all, I should help you understand what means collaboration. How can we try to define this collaboration? Because, in fact, some people talk about co-branding, and they limit the word co-branding to the situation where, for instance, for Louis Vuitton, um, Marc Jacobs collaborated with Murakami, the Japanese designer. So Murakami created with Marc Jacobs a product for Louis Vuitton. 
This was co-branding. You had the name of Murakami associated, but in the end, it stopped there. Then Murakami disappeared. The product was produced by Louis Vuitton, marketed by Louis Vuitton, distributed by Louis Vuitton. So you have certain cases where co-branding is just a limited collaboration between a brand and another brand, or a brand and a designer. Most of the time, it's not so clear. Think about Stel McCartney or Yui Yamamoto and Adidas. Here you had an alliance between a sports brand and a fashion designer. Both wanted to penetrate together a segment of, you can say, um, fashion sportswear or you know, fashion sports. And they worked together all over the chain. This collaboration starts at the level of the product design, but it goes along the entire value chain because the uh, Y3, Yo Yamamoto Adidas, or Adidas by Stella McCartney, ultimately will be sold potentially both in Adidas stores, certain Adidas stores, and in Stella McCartney stores. So you see that here, it's much more than co-branding. It's a global collaboration. After, you have some limited collaboration, like H&M, or Target, or Kohl's, or Uniqlo, mass retailers, with a designer. It's only a distribution partnership. It starts more or less here, and stops here. So, you know, it's a complex, it's a complex topic. You can understand better where collaborations can start, where until where they can go by keeping in mind these five simplified steps of the value chain of a brand. And of course, the question, the first question to understand collaboration, why, how is it relevant, is to understand what is the mix of image and business, because all collaboration have two purposes. More than that, but they should have a positive impact on the business, and they should also protect or even sometimes enhance the image. So to decode collaboration, first and foremost, you need to think in terms of image and business. And of course, in terms of brand DNA and codes compatibility. Because obviously, for the consumer in the end to understand the collaboration, there should be a common territory. How to assess this territory Obviously, the toolbox I gave you is going to be useful. What is the DNA of each brand? What are the codes? How can we create a story? Do we have enough values, enough territory in common that we can create something that will resonate in consumers' mind? After that, you know, uh, what is interesting is these collaborations have multiple objectives. Uh, it can be very different. Some objectives, obviously, have more to do with business. Some have more to do with image. You can think of it this way. But anyway, there should always be a balance. Most of the collaborations aim at increasing sales, customers, products. Awareness is also on the business side. But sometimes, you know, at the same time, you also need to convey exclusivity, you also need to enhance your image, you can use, take advantage of another brand to enhance maybe your creativity. So this is the, the two ways to, to look at it. Alors, let me show you some uh, funny cases to illustrate this part. I'm going to look at each of the five uh, steps in the production, in the, in the value of the product, uh, the brand, you know, from the design to the distribution. A lot of the collaborations which are here do not necessarily relate only to design. They may continue, like I told you. Um, for instance, um, Vivian Tam, Yolette Packard, or Jimmy Choo collaboration. But I will show you two cases. I will not go back to Louis Vuitton and Murakami, it's too old. I will take the most recent uh, collaboration of uh, Louis Vuitton with the iconoclast, you know, this project, you have seen it probably, Louis Vuitton icon, the monogram, and the iconoclast. And here you have, by the way, codes, codes already in action. You have the initials of the six iconoclasts who were part of this uh, global collaboration. Louboutin, you know, 
issue with Louis Vuitton, things are always very straightforward. It's all about efficiency, you know? Louis Vuitton is popular. Sometimes for certain customers, more popular than Louis Vuitton. So associating Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton with Louboutin or Louboutin with Louis Vuitton, you can imagine on the Louis Vuitton side what is the anticipated result. It's primarily image. You know, we want to show that Louis Vuitton is constantly innovative and now we are using the creativity, the appeal of Louboutin to add certain excitement to it. For Louboutin, it could be something different, but on the Louis Vuitton side, it's quite obvious. After that, you know, the product can also sell. <laughs> and here, as you can imagine, you have a product which is quite, quite nice. They play with the code, so you have the red color, leather on one side, and you have the monogram, canvas on the other side, and that product is selling. And that product is doing very well, because again, you know, you have some clients in this industry who always look for newness. They always want for pieces which are quite rare. No, no one knows whether that will stay forever or not. So there's, and it's an expensive bag, a few thousand euro again. And, and you have a product which brings together Louboutin and Louis Vuitton. Image and business. Ruska Lagerfeld, I'm not sure in terms of business, it will be so, so great, but in terms of the image, obviously, you know, bringing the name of Karl Lagerfeld together with Louis Vuitton. I don't think there is anything wrong with that. It's just funny to see that, uh, I don't know whether, I mean, the gloves, we know that Lagerfeld always wears gloves, but at the same time, the boxing gloves, if you keep in mind the window of Chanel at the moment, which uh, talk about women's in action, sports, it's a little funny that <laughs> it seemed that maybe Lagerfeld was influenced by what he was doing for Chanel. But anyway, for, for Le Vuitton, Buzz image. Frank Gehry, I'm not sure this product will sell a lot, so they are obviously more for image. But again, Frank Gehry is also associated with Louis Vuitton for the foundation, Louis Vuitton Foundation. So there is a kind of continuation in associating a very innovative uh, designer architect with Louis Vuitton. Ray uh, Kawakubo, it's an old story which started with uh, Marc Jacobs before. She has always been close to Louis Vuitton, and what's interesting is through her, you, Louis Vuitton can also, in terms of image, you know, maybe get close to a clientele which, is, which Louis Vuitton has maybe lost a little, which is the clientele of Comme des Garçons, the clientele of this Japanese designer, and she created a kind of trash, edgy note, edgy tote. Whether it will sell a lot, I don't know, but image, business, you, you choose. Mark Newson, again, I'm not sure this will be uh, in, in the stores forever, but uh, maybe Cindy Sherman, uh, it's kind of interesting how she played with uh, the codes of Louis Vuitton, bringing her own aesthetic, uh, you know, playing with the stickers, like the old hotel stickers on the trunk, now it's on the handbags, and that is quite funny. And again, you know, this is storytelling, this associates image of a lot of designers with Louis Vuitton. And then, you know, the mechanic works. It goes a little bit, of course, in the window display. This was the windows of, uh, uh, in, in, in Singapore recently. So you had all these collections in the windows with the, the you know, uh, Ray Kawakubo celebrating the monogram of Louis Vuitton. Or Frank Gehry celebrating the monogram of Louis Vuitton. Frank Gehry, the same Frank Gehry, who's also designed, as you know, the Louis Vuitton Foundation on, uh, in Paris, in uh, Bois de Boulogne. Alors, another case which is very interesting, uh, totally different. Here I'm going to talk shortly about beauty brands, and particularly makeup brands. You know, a lot of women use makeup, and they know that makeup has two pillars. A lot of makeup brands come from fashion, or luxury fashion, think Chanel at the extreme, uh, or they come from professional, you know, think uh, Shumura, think Mac at the other extreme. Obviously today, you know, there is a kind of game to be relevant to more clients. Fashion brands would like maybe to become more professional, and brands which are not perceived of fashion would like also to leverage on fashion. It's called 
in the industry, the game changer of classification. And uh, collaborations can help. So here you have a case of Lancôme. Lancôme is not totally professional, but it's absolutely not fashion. So they are more on the professional side. And Lancôme collaborating with Albert Elbaz. Albert Elbaz, talented designer of Lanvin, with also a strong design, code, uh, aesthetic, bringing his aesthetic to, to Lancôme, bringing also his fashion appeal to a brand which is more perceived as professional than fashion for makeup. So that's a, just a case, you know, and, and Lancôme did uh, others, but here it's also about playing with, with a strong visual display. You know, makeup is a very competitive sector. But they continued with Jason Wu in New York, uh, collaborating with him, another uh, fashion icon. They even did something with designers in Paris who designed certain small bags for, for your makeup. Again, it was the name of the designers associated with a, a, a cosmetic brand. But, you know, uh, Shu Umura does the same. Shu Umura, which is completely professional in Japan in particular, but it goes throughout the world, collaborates with different artists to also play this kind of uh, game, uh, changer of classification. And Mac, it's a never-ending story. Actually, it's a ritual for Mac. You know, every season they have new collaborations. So this is a way they completely made their clients used to associate Mark, professional makeup brand, with fashion brands. If you look at it from the perspective of Daphne Guinness, Alexander McQueen, Hello Kitty, of course these are brands who also need the business. For them, you know, there is a financial aspect to it, you know, they get some, 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 some funding, you know, from this collaboration. So each one has its own interest in terms of image and business. Manufacturing, you know, there are not so many cases, but I will share with you quickly one, which is a, a kind of best practice. Coming back to watches, one second. Uh, you know, watches is a very difficult word to penetrate for fashion brand, because if you are not Swiss, you do not exist. So Chanel, Hermès have been lucky enough to go to Switzerland early enough to become Swiss when it comes to watches, but uh, for Ralph Lauren, for Armani, it's very hard to really develop a line of luxury watches because they are not Swiss. And why would Swiss brands such as Rolex, such as Richemont, uh, license or help them develop watches? So here, Ralph Lauren found another way. Uh, it's a joint venture. And a joint venture is a, is a collaboration at the highest possible level between the two companies, between Richemont and Ralph Lauren. What is beautiful in this collaboration is that, you know, uh, without Richemont, Ralph Lauren could never have developed these kind of watches, which are assembled in Switzerland, where the connections of Richemont enable them to get the components from ETA, or sometimes, you know, the, the movements are just coming from the Richemont brands. So I will show you just beautiful pictures for your eyes. You know, they created four lines. And here you can see the first line called the, um, the Ralph Lauren steer up, the steer up, the equestrian code. Ralph Lauren is also about horse you know, and, and polo. The movement from Gégère Le Coultre. Incredible. Imagine for the people who are selling these watches, they can say, hey, we are case in Switzerland. You know, we are with Richemont and our movement comes from Gégère Le Coultre. On the slim collection, Piaget. What better reference for this brand? The sporting collection, of course, sports is more the field of IWC. So here the movements come from IWC or also Gégère Le Coultre. Alors, it's obvious that for Ralph Lauren, it's extremely beneficial in terms of business and image. For Richemont, it's another story. But I, I don't have time to go into too many details. I just show you. Uh, and the last one uh, is called the 867 Collection. It's an article uh, named after the address of the Ralph Lauren flagship store on Madison in New York. Um, 
What I want to say is here the collaboration goes throughout all the value chain because as you know, Richemont organized its own watch exhibition in Geneva and obviously Ralph Lauren Richemont watches are presented in Geneva. And they also benefit from the support of Richemont teams when it comes down to contacting wholesale clients because Ralph Lauren stores could not be enough to sell these watches. So whether it's production, design, uh, marketing, distribution, the two brands, the two groups collaborate and work together. Moving on, you know, you have all the collaborations which can be more focused on branding, branding, storytelling, enhancing the brand value, the brand DNA. You have a number of cases. I have picked only one, a funny one, uh, to show you again how a champagne brand can try to enhance its, uh, some unique element in its DNA through collaboration. Alors, Piper Heidsich is not Moët uh, Chandon. Piper Heidsich is not Krug, is not Veuve Clicquot. It's, it's a champagne brand which, for different reasons, has always been associated with celebrities which are a little bit borderline. So, you know, the idea of transgression, uh, provocation, has always been a little bit the, the territory of people Heights. So here, of course, you know, they develop some, some collaboration with designers who are themselves transgressive. So you have a common territory between the two. For instance, you know, <laughs> Victor and Rolf, these designers are very famous for having a, a DNA concept and a code. Oh, they are transgressive, they are crazy, and the code is upside down. So in their store, you know, it seems that the roof is the floor and the floor is the roof. So here, for this collaboration with people at Sish, they completely reverse the bottle, and you, you open the bottle from the, <laughs> from the bottom. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's, it's funny, it's storytelling. But with Jean-Paul Gauthier, you know, it was a little bit more transgressive. They created a packaging that looked like a, a, a women's red latex corset. Or le, les barésies, les barésies at le, le Lido or, or uh, you know, uh, Folie Bergère. And uh, the last one was with Le Boutin. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this one. A, a very transgressive collaboration, but which is so, I mean, it's not a big, big thing, but it's for people high sich a way to continue to tell the same story. Louboutin, high heel, high heel can be sometimes sexy, a little bit transgressive. But, you know, Louboutin told people Heidsich, let's do something together because I found in the past a tradition, a ritual. In Moscow, at the time of the Tsar, you know, the officer of the Russian army, when they used to go to the Bolshoi, to watch you know, the beautiful dancers. At the end of the night, they were drunk and they were toasting champagne in the shoes of the dancers. And at the Belle Epoque in Paris in 1910, all you know, the celebrities of the world were coming to Paris to go to Folie Bergère, to go to uh, Moulin Rouge, and the same ritual, completely, uh, completely crazy, you know, drunk at the end of the night, sipping champagne in the shoes of the ballerinas. So they created a similar story, and in this uh, packaging here, you have actually a bottle of uh, Piper Heidsich, red color. Of course, the color of Louboutin is also the red, and it's a glass, it's not a shoe, I don't, don't make a mistake, it's a glass. Now it plays with the codes of the champagne, you have the crystal, <laughs> the crystal hill, and you drink in the, sh in the shoe, it's a glass, you drink from, from this part. Well, again, this is just uh, to show you how here, this collaboration can continue to help people hide sich tell the same story. Alors, I, I have five more minutes, so I will finish with uh, this one. Uh, this one is nice. Um, maybe not all of you know this hotel. It's a, it's a luxury hotel brand. Uh, incidentally, the CEO is also ESSEC, <laughs> Richard Edetgui. Uh, Mandarin Oriental is an Asian uh, luxury hotel brand, which has a beautiful hotel in Paris. Uh, the CEO is ESSEC, but it's not the reason why I chose it. I chose it because uh, he has used collaboration 
in a very interesting way, uh, revisiting, if you wish, the concept of celebrity. So pay attention because it's a really a beautiful case. Uh, initially, Manawino Yentol, you know, is an Asian uh, brand of hospitality. So their, their logo is, the, they chose the fan and they, they try to co convey East meets West, you know, they are Asian, but they like to appeal to Western people. They like to merge a little bit Asian, Eastern and Western culture. So they like to delight their guests by uh, claiming, you know, their Asian uh, heritage. They don't have too many hotels. It's not Hilton, it's not Sheraton. They have maybe 30 hotels and they also want to enhance the fact that each hotel is individual. It's a, like a collection of luxury hotels, okay? So this is the beginning, it's the DNA of the brand. First, Genius ID, they, a few years ago, they decided to use the fan, you know, the Asian fan, as the logo of the brand. Why it was brilliant? Because the fan is a symbol of Asian hospitality, it's a symbol of grace, it's a symbol of, uh, of uh, something which is quite, you know, uh, nice and, and pleasant. Also, the fan, each hotel has its own fan. So what they did is they asked designers, or they bought sometimes some old fans, and they gave to each hotel one real fan, which is a symbol of the hotel, which is kept in a safe. And sometimes they can give to the guest some replica, of course, made out of uh, cheaper materials. And each, each hotel has its own fan, which already is very smart because they, are, they can convey through these individual fans the individuality of each hotel. They all belong to the same DNA, but they are all individual. And for instance, in Indonesia, they created a special fan with an Indonesian uh, designer bringing elements of Indonesian batik culture. So very interesting. After that, one uh, advertising agency suggested them to use celebrities, but in a very innovative way. You know, a lot of brands use celebrities, but the problem is the celebrities, they are the faces of different brands, and then it changes. So what they did, which was a little different, they decided to work with celebrities which liked Manawino Oriental, stayed there, were loyal to Manawino Oriental, and they made it a long-term strategy. And they called these celebrities fans. It's a play on world, like of course the fan. And also they chose celebrities, fans, which completely conveyed the values of the brand. They were aligned with the values of the brand and they were not celebrities because they wanted to be paid to be the face of the brand. They were clients, guests of the brand. And if you become a fan of Manuel Oriental, you remain a fan forever. So it was the birth of this long lasting campaign. And in luxury, something which can last has of course value. The beauty of it is that they play with the concept of each hotel is individual, has a double fan, the logo and the celebrity. It's not commercial. In fact, they don't pay the celebrities. They donate money to the charity of the choice of the celebrity. And uh, after that, they also make it very aesthetic by hiring artist photographers who create beautiful pictures of these celebrities, which are on the website. And of course, nowadays with social media, digital, it's not only pictures, it's also videos and everything. So since the beginning, there has been a lot of celebrities. Whenever they open a new hotel in the world, they try to find new celebrities that connect a little bit with this hotel, but they are not attached to one hotel. But for instance, when they opened the main oriental in Paris, it was the moment they decided to enroll in their program Sophie Marceau, because Sophie Marceau was a fan of Manuel oriental and she was French. It was the right moment to do it for them. Alors, you know, there are many people, but what is interesting is that most of these fans convey, and I think it's not just by chance, they convey really the DNA of Manuel oriental 
Vivian Tam, she's born in China, she moved to New York. She's a complete blend of East and the West. Kenzo Takada, of course, is Japanese, he loves Paris, he lives in France, he sold his brand to LVMH. Maggie Cheng, she's the most famous actress, Chinese actress in the West. Mr. Pai, American Chinese, known everywhere. Vanessa Mae, an interesting mix. Michelle Yeo, also a very interesting mix of different nationality. All these people bring together East and West. Sir David Tong, the founder of Shanghai Tong, when he's in Hong Kong, he's Chinese. When he's in London, he's British. A perfect case of East meets West. Darcy Bussell, same. And re more recently, because they were opening more hotels in China, they, they also looked for you know, new celebrities. But again, Sa Ding Ding, she is a, a singer. She's bringing together Eastern and Western music. So it's an interesting case. Karen Mok, she is half Chinese, half Welsh a quarter Iranian, a quarter German, so a very interesting case of uh, bridging cultures, a very international Taiwanese actress and model, Lin Chiling. And uh, I will just show you a small video to show you how it works on the website with the last celebrity to join the program, the last fan, I should say, uh, Lucy Liu, Chinese name, but totally American. So if you click on the website, you see the website, you see the fan, you see the, the fans, the real fans, and if you click on her, and you want to know why she's a fan. I am a fan of art. I love going to museums and concerts. I'm also a fan of Shakespeare in the Park in the summer, which is so much fun. I'm a fan of cooking for friends and family, having big dinners. I am also a fan, of course, of UNICEF and BAM, Ignite for Kids. I'm a fan of comedy. I think laughing is so important and one of the biggest gifts you can have. Um, I'm a fan of animals. I am a fan of not putting any limitations on myself. I'm a fan of traveling and exploring and being adventurous. I am a fan of Mandarin Oriental. I chose this case because I, I think it was a little different from the others. You know, it's, it's, it's involving, obviously, um, PR, communication, but it's revisiting the celebrity in a way which is reinforcing the DNA and the codes of the brand. Bon, allez, last but very quick. Of course, this you heard about. You have a lot of collaborations that are restricted to distribution, or distribution is the main purpose. You have very different categories, but today I will only uh, revisit very, very quickly the collaboration between uh, mass retailers and designers, just maybe to make you think a little bit differently about this. H&M has been a, a master of the art, you know, they started with Lagerfeld many years ago. Then they continued with uh, uh, McCartney, Victor and Wolf, remember Victor and Wolf, Cavalli, uh, Comme des Garçons, Sonia Riquel, Williamson, Jimmy Chu. Um, and I, I, I didn't go until the end. There was Lanvin, yes, Versace, Marnie. Alors, if you think of it, you know, what do uh, these uh, designers have in common? Think about one second, you know, whether it is Marnie, Versace, Lanvin. Uh, Sonia Riquel, Jimmy Choo, a little less, but uh, uh, Cavalli, <laughs> Karl Lagerfeld, McCartney, Victor and Wolf. What do they have in common? Can you guess? You may like them, you may know them, so they are relatively famous, but... Oh yes, they have a strong identity. No, it's very important because, of course, without identity, how could H&M clients, you know, recognize, identify themselves with something which should bring together a little bit of the designer and still H&M price point should not be too far. But apart from having an identity, relatively strong, visual, what else do they have in common? Think about the first thing I told you about this collaboration, image and business. They all need the business. You know, this is something 
in my courses, I, I come from the business. So, you know, what you learn in the books is one thing. When you work in the business, you realize that in the end, cash is king. You know, so here, you know, believe me, a lot of people always forget that. Why Lanvin does that? Why Versace does that? You know, it's dilution, diluting the brand, blah, 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 blah. The problem is, you know, most of these brands I showed you, they are beautiful. Lanvin is a beautiful brand. It hardly makes money. They need the business. They need the cash. With that cash, they can open store. With that cash, they can develop a digital marketing strategy. So, you know, image and business. Obviously, here, in these cases, these brands, these designers, have to take some risk. They have to take some risk. I'm not telling you it's necessarily ideal. Also, you know, you can also think of it as a way to recruit potentially new clients. So, on the image, you know, they try to reduce the risk by making it short term, limited production, limited time, a few stores only. But most of the time, they need the business. So this is also something I would like you to, to remember in these collaborations. Image, business. Sometimes it's more on one side, more on the other side. They all need the business. And uh, there was one case which went maybe a little too far. That was the case of Martin Margiela, you know. Maison Martin Margiela, here, why I show it to you, it's my last slide, because their DNA is almost completely at the opposite of H&M. H&M is all about fast fashion, high visibility, big logo, big colors. Maison Martin Margiela, not in terms of design, in terms of concept. It's the cult of discretion. It's almost the cult of you hide yourself. You hide the face of the salespeople. You hide the face of, of Mata Margiela himself. So here, we almost have a case where the, the DNA and the codes of the two brands, H&M and Maison Marta Margiela, were almost totally antagonistic. And uh, by the way, this is one of the collaboration that didn't work well. A lot of products stayed on the shelves because I think here you were asking too much. You know, there was not enough in common between Maison Marta Margiela and H&M that could make certain clients, whether they were from Maison Marta Margiela or from H&M, understand and connect with this collaboration. So, image and business, DNA and code compatibility. That's maybe the two important takeaways you could uh, remember from this presentation to assess collaborations. Thank you.